Today's topic, energy passage through an ecosystem. Two questions we need to answer. We uh, talked last time about biogeochemical cycles and the cycle of matter through an ecosystem. So first of all, we have to define energy. And then second of all, we have to talk about whether it's a cycle or not. And then we'll go on from there. So energy. First of all, the book definition of energy is the ability to do work. The ability to do work, this is directly out of your 7th grade science book. And work is defined as the ability to, or as moving something. So, the ability to move something is essentially what we have here. Here are some examples of energy that we find around us. We have kinetic energy, solar energy, electrical energy, nuclear energy, mechanical energy, thermal energy, and chemical energy. Now there's a word on here that you may have, there's a word that's not on here that you may have heard. And I want to add that to this list, and that is the term potential energy. Now what potential energy is, is the energy something has because of where it is. Or sometimes we call this stored energy. Something you have to understand is that all of these are types of energy there can be potential electrical energy. Okay? For example, the switch being off stores electrical energy. You turn the switch on and now those electrons are moving down a wire to run the lights. Or something like that. Okay? So, there is really two major themes here. There's kinetic energy, the energy of moving electrons, the energy of moving parts, the energy of moving air molecules, and then there's potential energy. That's the stored energy, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. The second question was, is it a cycle? And the answer to that is no. Energy can be neither created nor destroyed, but it is in cycle. Much of it is used by the organisms to take it in. We say that energy is transformed if something is transformed it goes from one form to another transform so energy is neither created nor destroyed it's transformed from say chemical energy to thermal energy Very important idea. All the energy on Earth that we have on Earth comes from the sun. There is nothing to give it back, so it can't cycle. We're not putting heat energy. It's not heating up the sun. The sun has its own energy, and it's giving off its energy. And, we, and here on Earth, we are using that energy that's coming from the sun. It is being transformed into other things, but it's not being given back. And... Some of you are wondering maybe about that argument that all energy comes from the sun, and we'll talk about that in class tomorrow. Remember, always you may always pause these at any time and uh, catch up. All right, passage of energy. We can, throw the passage, we can show the passage of energy through an ecosystem in three ways. Here's the first way, and many of you have heard of this before. Something called a food chain. And I'll put it all up here and then talk about it. In a food chain, the first organism in any food chain is something called the producer. Producer...
is an autotroph. Now we learned about autotrophs back in the beginning of the year when we talked about characteristics of light. It's a way to obtain and use energy. They take the energy of the sun and produce food. The second, that producer passes energy on to something like a grasshopper. Grasshopper is called the primary consumer. The primary consumers are generally herbivores, although they may be omnivores. Humans may be primary consumers. If you're a vegetarian, you are always a primary consumer. You eat producers. The energy that, so the sun's energy makes the grass grow. The grasshopper eats the grass, which means it's getting the original energy from the sun into it. And then it passes it on to the snake. The snake would be called the secondary consumer. Secondary consumers are carnivores or omnivores. And then the snake passes its energy on to the hawk. We use the fancy word tertiary consumer for hawk. key concept in making food chains. We'll be doing this in class. Arrows go in the direction of energy flow. Arrows go in the direction of the flow of energy. Okay, a lot of people when they make a food chain draw arrows going the other way. Remember, the grasshopper is getting the energy from the grass. You show the arrow going that way. On here we have decomposers, fungi. Because really, Fungi are not necessarily included in a food chain. They, maybe they should be because they're decomposers or bacteria that are also decomposers. That all of these things, if they don't get eaten, I don't know why I do these arrows. So not all of the grass gets eaten. Some of it decomposes. And then its nutrients are put back in the soil. So the solid parts are used. The fungi use that energy. Second way to show is something called a food web. And we're going to deal with food webs in a little bit more, but all a food web really is is a bunch of interconnected food chains. So here's a food chain. Grass, grasshopper, shrew, horned owl. Here's a different food chain. Grass, rabbit, hawk. Different one, grass, grasshopper, skunk, owl. Okay, so we say that these are interconnected food chains. This is really how an ecosystem works. A rabbit is not the only organism to feed, can feed on grass. Third way we can show the passage of energy is with something called an ecological pyramid. Ecological pyramids show the relative amount of energy passed through the environment. Ecological pyramids show the relative amount of energy passed through the environment. There are three types. The first is called a pyramid of energy. And this doesn't look like a pyramid, so I'm going to draw some boxes on here to represent In an ecological pyramid or in a food chain, each one of these levels is called a trophic or feeding level. We've seen the word troph before. We talked about heterotrophs and autotrophs. Troph means feeding. So at each trophic level, the statement is made here that 10% of the energy available at this level, I'm sorry, 10% of the available 10% of the energy here is available for this one. So in other words, of all of the energy a grass takes in, if a grass takes in 1,000 units of energy, there are 100, when a grasshopper eats the grass, it'll get, if it eats all the grass, it'll only get 100 units out. And if a frog eats all this grasshopper, it's only getting 10 units of all the energy. If, okay, if a grasshopper has 100 units of energy that it's eaten. 
the frog is only going to get 10 out of it if it, only, if it eats the whole grasshopper. Why? Where does 90% of the energy go? Well, what do organisms do with the energy they take in? What do you do when you eat something? Well, you use it to run you. So heartbeat, heart, muscles, etc. You use it to grow. You give some off as heat. So, organisms use about 90% of the energy they take in and they store the rest. Not for something to eat, it just happens that way. So, if a grass takes in a thousand units of energy, a hundred units of energy is available for the grasshoppers. 10 units of that energy is available for the second consumer, the secondary consumer, and only one unit of energy is available for the top level consumer. That's a really important idea when we look at a pyramid of biomass. Here's a pyramid of biomass. If we take and we weigh biomass, mass on earth is a synonym for weight, bio means life, we take all the weight of life. Here's a hypothetical biomass pyramid. A million kilograms of primary producer will feed 100,000 kilograms of producer. I mean, I'm sorry, of consumer. Why? 10% rule. And so in an ecosystem in the ocean, in this case, for example, phytoplankton are really small uh, extraordinarily small, single cells sometimes, or a few, few cell uh, organisms that float around in the ocean and do phyto, means plant-like, they do photosynthesis. They're autotrophs. Well, if there's a million kilograms of those, that would be enough to feed 100,000 kilograms of herbivores, which would be enough to feed 10,000 kilograms of shrimp which would be enough to feed a thousand kilograms of fish, which would be enough to feed a hundred kilograms of shark. Okay, because of the 10% rule, that only 10% of the energy is available to the next level. Okay, so if we look at this a second, let me erase the ink. Since only 10% of the energy is available, the mass of each trophic level, the mass, tends to be about 10% of the one below it. Which leads us to the last way we can show it, is something called a pyramid of numbers. Maybe you never wondered, why are there less hawks? Although I didn't draw that right. Ox. The number of ox is less than the number of rabbits, is less than the number of plants. Why? Well, ox are carnivores. They feed on rabbits or things like them. Rabbits are herbivores, they feed on plants. Because of the 10% rule, there are only enough plants to feed a few a certain number of rabbits. And it takes more than one rabbit to feed a hawk. So when we look at a food chain or a food an ecological pyramid, and we're talking about if this is a hawk in an ecosystem, and this is something like a snake in an ecosystem, and this is something like a I don't know a mouse in an ecosystem, and this is something like plants in an ecosystem. The numbers get very big. Like the numbers go from big at the bottom, small at the top. It takes way more energy to feed a carnivore than it does to feed an herbivore. Here's a different example of a pyramid of numbers. Every once in a while you get a pyramid where it looks like this. Because, you only, because an oak tree is so big, by mass, it's huge. 
But by numbers, there's only one. But one oak tree can feed a gajillion caterpillars, which can feed a gajillion, which can feed quite a few uh, small birds, which can feed a sparrow hawk. So eat their three, to recap, food chains, food webs, and the three kinds of ecological pyramids, and the 10% rule.